Hi, I'm Mark Sheriff, and welcome to Virtual Deers. It's so great to have you with us, and I'm here with the very first video for this series, How to Design a Research Question. So the objectives of this video and for the entire session are to talk about the different qualities and understand those qualities of a good research question. Uh, I want you to be able to differentiate between different types of research questions, know how to revise your research question to make it stronger, feel more confident in developing a research question. And then there's gonna be an opportunity during this video and also during the live session on actually working on your research question. So let's start at the beginning. A good research project has to have a good research question. If you don't have one, you're gonna be kind of floundering out there. Now, it's not uncommon for research questions to kind of morph and change as you're going through a project. And let's see kind of what happens there. This is from XKCD. If you're not familiar with the comic, it's, it's great. Um, but here we go, you know, jelly beans cause acne, scientists investigate. We're playing Minecraft. Yeah. We found no link between jelly beans and acne, P greater than 0 0.05. Of course that 0 0.05 means everything. Spoiler alert, we're gonna talk about how it doesn't mean everything, but uh, that settles that. I hear it's only a certain color that causes it. Scientists? So what do they do? Let's check all the colors. No link between purple, brown, pink, blue, teal, salmon, red, turquoise, magenta, yellow, gray, tan, cyan, green. Oh, <gasps> we found it with green. Mauve, beige, lilac, black, peach, and ori, and of uh, or, and and orange. And of course, at the end, then we say green jelly beans linked to act ninety five percent confidence. Yeah. So this was not the study they went out to study and. If you check 20 things and one of them happens to come out and P is 0 0.05, your odds of hitting, yeah. Sometimes we go searching. Sometimes we go searching for a research question based upon the data that we find and we start creating results and they don't need to be there. But it's understandable how this happens, particularly in CS education. I mean, think about it the way we do things in our class, right? You think of a new thing that you want to try and you're so excited about it. I'm going to do a flip classroom. I'm going to try uh, a mastery based grading. I'm going to try XP system. I'm going to try some gamification and you're so excited about it. And then you do the thing, right? And the students, you know, they like it. They say, Hey, this, this worked really well. This improved my learning. I was more motivated. And you said, okay, great. That'll be my baseline. Then I'm just going to do the thing next semester and let's throw in a survey or two. Bam! I now have a 60 paper ready to go. Yeah. Uh, how many of us are guilty of doing something like this? I don't know if you're raising your hand or not. I can't see through the monitor, but possible that you are. So I want you to take two seconds and pause the video and think for a moment. What are some problems with this? Are you pausing? Are you done pausing? Okay. What are some problems? Well, here's some. First off, it's going to introduce bias. You are a faculty member that just did this cool thing that you were super excited about and you saw that it worked and you're going to go into the next semester basically bent on showing that this thing worked because you found something exciting. You're, you have bias. Um, it's not uncommon for this to happen. I mean, as educators, we want to do the thing that is the best thing for our students. So of course we're excited about it, but is that the best thing research wise? Also, if you're searching for a hypothesis, you can often find one. Uh, if you are looking through anecdotal data on whether your technique worked or not, you can probably come up with something. You don't do it the opposite way. You need to start with the research question, start with your hypothesis, then apply your treatment and see what happens. Not apply your treatment and go back and say, well, what happened here? There's another type of study that does that, and we'll get to that eventually. Also, you might not have all the data that you need. So if you think about that baseline semester that I mentioned in the example study, do you have all the information that you need? Do you have information about um, student demographics or how students participated in class or how they did the assignments or anything like that, which then leads into, did you do the proper setup? Do you have consent from the people from the previous semester to use their data? Do you have an IRB approval? Did you need an IRB approval? Spoiler alert, yes, you probably did need to go to the IRB before you started the study, but again, we'll get to that in a later video. So there's a lot of problems with just kind of ad hoc throwing things together. Now, does that mean that the work that you just did is not worthy? Of course not. That's a wonderful experience report paper 
that you could then submit to SIGSI or to an education track, at some other conference. Um, you could classify it as a case study, but <clears throat> you're not going to classify that as a good empirical study because you didn't do the proper study design up first. So, you know, why do we let these things happen? You know, sometimes we don't intend to go into doing a research project, but you did something that was so exciting that you want to share it with people. And so you, you are just, so you're just ready to get that information out there. That's a great thing. We want you to have that sort of passion about CS education, but when we're sharing it as an empirical study, we need to be more careful about it. Some of us do have pe pr uh, pressure to get papers out. It really depends upon your position and the university that you're at, but it, it varies, but that could be something. And we're also sometimes scared of publishing bad results. You, you don't, you know, I mean, teachers don't like to go in and say, hey, I did this thing and it was terrible. My students hated it so much. The funny thing is, is that data is actually pretty useful for people, particularly if they are thinking about doing something similar, they could avoid certain pitfalls. So don't be afraid of publishing bad results, or at least trying to publish bad results. Obviously, sometimes publishing negative studies can be difficult in its own right, but that's not, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. And also, we're busy. We're super busy. I mean, um, m many of us have larger teaching loads, particularly in a teaching track side, and being able to plan out these studies makes it tough. So we recognize that there are challenges to doing a good research study and to actually setting it up properly at the beginning and moving forward. But how do we not let that happen? The best thing you can do is come up with a good research question at the beginning, lay it out, and once you have that planned, you will find it so much easier to follow through with the rest of your, the rest of your study. So all of you came in to Deers, or if you're watching this later, you, you probably have a research question that you are very excited about. So again, I'm gonna ask you to pause that video just for a moment. And I want you to think about what makes a good research question. You done? You done thinking? There's a ton of acronyms that people have come up for this set of data, uh, for these, this set of criteria. Um, but in reality, if you look at all the different, you know, five letter, four letter, three letter mnemonic devices for remembering these concepts, uh, sometimes they combine some concepts, sometimes they move them apart. This is the five that we like, but honestly, look at any, any resource on creating research questions, you will find these aspects first. Is the research question interesting? Is it something the community cares about? Is it something that um, is uh, extendable past just one university? Sometimes that, that doesn't matter as much, but sometimes you really want something that is going to have a broad impact. Is the research question answerable? Is this a question at the end of your project, you can actually come out and say yes or no, or some, it indicates in some way. There are some research questions that are so broad, so, so all encompassing that it's like answering the question of the universe. It's you're, you're not going to come up with an answer here within any reasonable point of time. Is your research question repeatable? So is this something that someone else at another university could apply your treatment and then see if it worked for them? Not all studies are going to be repeatable and that's okay. For instance, let's say you're doing a study on I don't know, a um, experience uh, where students go to Argentina to help work on some service learning project. Now, that's gonna be really hard to exactly replicate, but you could replicate aspects of it potentially. And so how do you go about communicating that? Is your research question measurable? Are there metrics, are there data you can actually gather that will help you answer the question? Are you looking at assessments? Are you looking at scores? Are you looking at retention? What are those metrics? And finally, is it appropriately scoped? If you have completed a PhD, this is probably something that your PhD advisor just yelled at you about for uh, forever, is narrow your scope, narrow your scope, narrow your scope. If you are trying to, again, answer the universe, you're never gonna finish. A smaller scoped research project that you can finish, that you can come to an answer on, is way better than the massive project that is multi-year, multi-class, that sounds amazing, 
but you never finish it. So is it appropriately scoped? So let's dig into each of these a little bit more. How do you know if something's interesting or not? I mean, you could ask yourself, you know, do I find this interesting? And, you know, maybe you're a good barometer for what the community is all about. But, you know, if you want people to accept a paper on it or to read your study and be excited about it, is it something they want to see? So start by determining, you know, is there a larger problem you're trying to address? Are you looking at student retention? Are you looking at performance? Are you looking at diversity? Are you looking at motivation? Are you, what's the broad category? And then what are you using as your data set? What are you using for your metrics? Uh, are, are you creating a tool? Are you changing something in your curricula? Are you making a new assignment? Are you, what are you doing? Then go out there and check the literature. Ask your colleagues, ask on the SIGC members mailing list. Look through the ACM Digital Library. Look through the uh, IEEE Explore. Google search for heaven's sakes. Go see what's out there. And it might be that you're looking for things that aren't even necessarily in computer science education literature. If you're doing something like Flip Classroom, our friends over in chemistry and physics have been doing this forever. Are you looking in the broader education literature as well? Does that mean that it's going to be a one-to-one -one mapping? No, of course not. But you have the ability to go out and see what is out there. Now, what if you find there's a ton of stuff out there? What does that tell you? Well, one, you found that it's interesting. But now two, is it something that you have novel, something novel to say about? Where is your niche? Well, how are you contributing to the body of knowledge in this area? If you go out and you don't find much, you've either found something brand new um, on emerging area, but then you might want to start talking to individuals to say, hey, what do you think about this idea? So is it interesting? Is it answerable? Can you come to some sort of conclusion? Or at the end, is it going to be just kind of this nebulous, oh, well, it appears that something's, you know, it, if you come up with a really broad question, and if your answer is yes, but, or yes, and, or no, and. So look at this example question. Do flipped classrooms make courses better? I mean... Sometimes, in some ways, kinda? It's a terrible question. Look at the better version. Does using a flipped classroom pedagogy with novice programmers in an introductory course lead to higher grades on assessments compared to a standard classroom scenario? Wow, we blew that question out a bit, didn't we? How have we changed it? We have now narrowed our scope down to Novice programmers and introductory course, as opposed to flip classrooms across all of STEM, for instance. That's a little bit more answerable. How are we measuring whether there is an impact or not? Well, we're going to look at grades on assessments. What's our comparison point? We're going to look at a standard classroom, maybe a previous semester. So now we have laid out in our research question something that is way more um, approachable, something that, that, that you can make a plan around. So make sure your question is answerable. Um, think about what your main variable is. How are you adjusting your treatment and what are you trying to see the impact of that treatment? Is your study repeatable? Could you do this again in the future? Could you give it to a colleague at the same university and see if they could do it? Could um, another university period do it? Could another subject do it? It depends. You know, is your research question so focused on something that only happens at your institution that it's impossible? So I've seen studies on uh, you know, a residential learning experience that really can only happen at a particular university. That doesn't mean that doesn't have value. It just means it's going to be tougher for there to be repeatability or comparison with other projects. And you, you need to be able to, to denote that in your threats to validity when you are explaining your research project. Now, um, these external factors can come up in many different ways. It could be a time event. It could be you know, some sort of special opportunity, just keep it in mind, right? If you can make it generally applicable so other people can do it, that's great. If you can't, just make sure you make a note of that. Is it measurable? What metrics are you gathering? Once you come up with a research question, you should be able to say, what data can I gather that will help me answer this question? It could be survey data. It could be assessment and test data. It could be demographic data. Maybe you're looking at retention for underrepresented, underrepresented minorities. Maybe you're looking at um, uh, the enrollment of certain courses, uh, male versus female. Maybe you're looking at, do we have more uh, first-time college students declaring the major? 
do you have access to this data? Now, some of this data might be stuff that you can get easily. And some of this stuff might be data that you have to get university permission because maybe you're dipping into FERPA uh, protected data. I mean, grades are FERPA protected as well. But as you're gathering data, you need to be cognizant of the um, privacy restrictions that are placed on this data. And the earlier you can identify these data sources, the absolute better it is. You'll have to identify this data in your IRB submission, which we'll talk about in the IRB video, so that um, you aren't trapping yourself in an instance where you might not, uh, where, where you, you are getting data you, pro you don't necessarily need to have. Uh, and then be very intentional about how you codify this data and where you're going to save the data. So making sure that you code the data such that you are retaining any anonymity as necessary, making sure that you are following your university's regulations where you're allowed to store data. For instance, many universities don't really want you storing FERPA data in Google Drive. I mean, some it's okay because of the, the agreements that you might have. But for instance, at my university, it's kind of frowned upon. Uh, so we use Box or we use Qualtrics, which are uh, the university has some agreements with as far as ensuring confidentiality of data. So make sure you, you talk to your information technology folks. Uh, I can guarantee you they have information on what you are allowed or, or, or should or shouldn't be able to use. Is it appropriately scoped? Now, I think we're all guilty at some point of having the big idea, right? And say, thinking this project is going to be amazing and I'm going to do this multi-year study of CS1 students across multiple universities. And that's a great idea. Don't do that first. <laughs> I mean, it's, you, you need to bite off a chunk you can chew. We're all busy. It is tough to do good educational research. Find something that you can hone in on and do a great job with. And don't worry about it if you're not ready to do the big project yet. You can always come back to your project and do the next step. Start with the small step first, okay? You know, uh, think about how many students you are actually willing to personally interview in order to get your data. Do you have help in gathering your data and storing it and making sure that it is protected in the right way? You know, what are your other obligations to your department? These are realities of trying to do education of any sort of research, actually, is making sure that you actually have the time to do what you need to do. So let's do another activity. Look at this question. What impact do teaching assistants have on students? Interesting. Answerable, repeatable, measurable, scope. How would you improve it? I want you to pause the video again, take a moment, and see if you can write down a better version of this research question. Go. Are you doing it? Are you done? I know there's a, at least one person right now that's staring at me with a death glare for doing that again. But you know what? Sometimes it's good to have you do a little bit of an activity. Here's the real question that this came from. How, if at all, do T's, TA's beliefs about teaching and teaching confidence relate to student content knowledge gains in an inquiry-based general chemistry lab? Okay, let's flip between the two. Interesting. Well, what impact do teaching assistants have on students? I mean, that's something we, a lot of people super care about. Is it answerable? Well, what are we trying to answer here? Hopefully the question you thought was, what does impact mean? Does it impact their um, motivation? Does it impact their grades? Does it impact, you know, what, what does it mean by impact here? So in the second question, we change impact specifically to student content knowledge gains. So this is something that would be measurable by quiz questions, by other forms of assessment. How do we measure Impact, if we are trying to determine if impact is motivation or grades or retention or whatever, we are now gathering many different data sources. That's probably not repeatable and it's definitely not scope. Whereas in the full question, in the, in the revised question, this is repeatable. And this is scope because this is something that you could 
definitely take a look at uh, across one semester and, you know, interview the TAs and understand what their beliefs about teaching and teaching competence are. So this is survey-based data, most likely interview qualitative data to, that allows you to kind of determine your TA's level of confidence and ability in teaching and then look at the students that they worked with and kind of go from there. There's a lot more to this question, obviously, and I encourage you to go look at the paper here. Um, Lindsay Wheeler and Jenny Chu, um, the first and third authors are very good. And so I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of good stuff in this particular paper as well. So when you're coming up with that research question, what type of research questions are out there? Well, there's this descriptive kind. What are students' perceptions of group quizzes and introductory course? It's kind of that broad, I don't really have a comparison. It's more of an exploratory sort of question. There are the differences between groups question. What differences, if any, exist in student attitudes regarding computer science between students who use X and those that do not? So now we've set up basically an A-B uh, testing environment. We have some students using one versus not using one. And how do those compare to each other? We're gonna talk about how to do that in designing your study. And then relational. What relationship, if any, exists between students' attendance in office hours and test scores for an introductory course? So instead of kind of an A-B test, these are kind of two things going together. As X goes up, does Y go up as well? And so, you know, as you're thinking about what are you trying to test and, and those aspects of a question, you know, where are you coming from? Are you exploring some area? Are you trying to compare ideas? Are you trying to do a replication study? That's not a bad thing, by the way. Uh, are you trying to do some sort of survey of ideas? The options are limitless. Um, there are so many open questions that we have in computing education, or in, 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 in research in general, obviously, but what are you excited about? What is the community excited about? What, 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 do, you, what do you want to get involved in? So hopefully you have right now that, that idea, that seed of an idea that you're excited about that you, that you can't wait to get working on. So let's start examining your research question. What is your overarching goal? What do you hope to show or improve by answering your question? What effect do you want to have? What questions should you try to ask in order to answer your research question? So if, you're, if your question is something like, um, what is the effect of TA beliefs, on student TA beliefs on teaching a CS1 course on retention, what are, what are the questions you need to ask? Well, how many students were retained and what are the TA beliefs? Well, now that you know the questions, what are those metrics? How do you measure TA beliefs? How do you measure retention? So the retention's the easy one, right? That's a number. You look at enrollment in course, do students stay in course two? But how do you measure their beliefs? So then you start going out and looking at other studies that have done similar ways of measuring confidence and belief, and then you start developing those metrics that you are going to gather along the way. So now we know the data items we need to gather, how are we gonna gather them? When are you going to sit down with your TAs and talk to them about their beliefs? Are you gonna do it at the beginning of the semester? Are you gonna do it partway through the semester when things might've changed? When do you gather retention data? Do you gather your data at the drop withdraw deadline? Do you gather it at the add drop deadline? I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong answer here, but it's a question you need to ask yourself because you need a plan so if you're gonna do this over multiple semesters, you're always gathering your data at the same point to get the right comparisons. Is your question interesting, answerable, repeatable, measurable, and scope? So that's the first session on how to design a research question. We're gonna talk a lot more about this and do some group work together during uh, the first in-person session to talk about uh, your research question, get some feedback on it, and start iterating on them. So, I hope this has been useful. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop me an email and we'll certainly talk more about it in the session on Monday. So it's great to have you here at Deers. We're so excited to see you and we'll see you soon. Bye.